Marjorie, thank you so much for coming. Uh, you're the founder of Luxo at Luxo. I would say you're, you define yourself as entrepreneur and designer, right? Uh, I, by the way, I've seen the Luxo website and it looks incredible. So I love thank it you. and that's already. Um, but yeah, uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself um, and uh, just give us a little bit of a brief introduction uh, to who you are, what you're doing currently, and then we will take it from there. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you, Ambria. Super happy to be in your podcast. Um, thank you for inviting me. So yeah, as you said, I'm the founder of Luxo. I'm a Venezuelan born German. Um, we operate our company Luxo. We are based, or the company that it's creating the Luxo network is based in Berlin. So as am I and most of our team as well. Um, and Berlin has basically become a little bit of like the blockchain capital of the world, in my opinion, or at least the European capital. Um, and, you know, being here basically has informed a lot of how my career basically evolved. Um, I, my background is originally in architecture and design. That was my, my first degree was in architecture and my second degree was in media art and design. Um, and early in my career, you know, I did my architectural license and I did the whole thing. And then I realized as beautiful it is to study architecture is not really, um, uh, profession that I want to practice because I had a problem with the speed. It really takes years and years. You have to have a lot of patience mm. to execute yeah, You need to qualify projects. it, right? You need to qualify yeah, it, it to do, yeah. Yes, and just the projects, you know, it takes years and years to, in order to something to materialize effectively. And I think, you know, it's a wonderful profession and a wonderful training because it really gives you this left brain, right brain kind of yeah. balance you know you have a lot of like a similar training to an architect uh, to an engineer and similar training to um let me mute my computer for a second and similar training to just a traditional design training so this gives you a lot of skills that you have and you know you're not overwhelmed with complexity and large projects so i think that's something that i really appreciate from my education um and that's when i decided after i did my license in architecture that i will move to germany um and you know do something new and i did this new masters in media art and design between germany and the us and, you know, I started working, doing a lot of like art direction and creative strategy, brand strategy, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and in one point in time, me and my partner uh, around 2013, we started buying Bitcoin just for the fun of it, uh, because we read this article about Canadian vice house in Bitcoin. And I thought like somebody pays something with something that I don't know what it is. So I found it fascinating. And um, we got into the kind of like that early, um, in our opinion, early Bitcoin wave. And obviously we were fascinating by the, fascinated by the, by the technology. And then in 2015, when we were already living in Berlin, um, my partner started working for the Ethereum Foundation. Oh, so wow. we, he joined the Ethereum Foundation very early on. And then we kind of like became part of the, the, the epicenter of community, the yeah. Of the community, right? And at the beginning was a very, very early community. The, you know, the meetups were very small. Yeah, barely to know women in there, you know, like it was very interesting just to see it, how it grew. And it took me a while to realize how big has become um, after that point in time. And, you know, afterwards, during that time, I had a, a really good friend who offered me this amazing opportunity of building an innovation lab in-house for a consultancy company for Ang San Yang. And I was like, that sounds great. I can do that. Um, the idea was to have, you know, kind of like a creative approach to business building and through my work i was doing a lot of work in switzerland for like brand strategy and brand experience and i thought oh it's a great stuff i can do it um and in my process of becoming basically a consultant for Ernst and young and building this innovation lab um all of our clients who are like major swiss and german corporations still wanted to do something with the blockchain and my boss and everybody in the in our company at least in the berlin team they were like one well, no, no, us know what it is but you marjorie you know what it is so you take you take on those projects so um, i was like at that point in time i didn't consider myself an expert at all and i would have never claimed the right to do any of those projects um but you know it was a point in time obviously i was dealing with the people that i knew that knew about blockchain they were like 
really smart developers building the core of the technology. Um, obviously, for the job that I was required to do, I was very well qualified and I was very well yeah. you know, able to mm -hmm. take a point, but I was very, for me, it was very daunting. I will never have suggested I will do those. But then we did some very cool um, you know, implementations of blockchain technology, specifically of Ethereum very early on, you know, around 2015, 2016. Um, working with like pharmaceutical companies and automotive and, you know, solving all of those problems that we know the blockchain can solve. So I did that. And in that point on time, also the IOTA Foundation became one of my clients at Ernst & Young the, very early when they were just, just getting started um, before of any, any controversies or anything, when it was a very, very early project and one of its founders, Dominique, I consider him to be very smart. So I was really happy to work with him. So in that point in time, I realized, you know, I have all of this experience. I'm basically in the epicenter of, you know, of this huge economy. I went to, you know, all of the, like we all did, to all of the conferences around the world. Consensus and all of that? Have you been to and New all York? Of that, yeah, of course. And then I realized like, okay, this thing grew, man. Like this is way bigger than I thought it was yeah. because for me, obviously the technology was going to change the world, but I didn't know... Uh, in which point was going to exit the world of developers and enter the world of business and more so the mainstream world. So when, you know, I realized it was happening, I thought this is a great moment to use, use the great competitive advantage that I have as a person with the knowledge and the connections that I have, you know, yeah. have made during those years to start my own venture. I'd like to ask yeah. you a question because as you yeah. as you glance through your story, I had to. It's yeah. the first time I'm noting down questions because there yeah. are so many points that I wanted to ask you about. Um, sure. So, if it's okay, I'll go chronologically based on what you said. So, first, I'm yes. really curious because you said that you know Berlin uh, is the kind of epicenter, right, for blockchain yeah. technology. Um, mm -hmm. Why is that? Why is that? Uh, from your opinion, from what perspective? Business perspective, legal perspective. Um, yeah, you know because. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. So I think it's more from a community perspective. Um, very early on, you know, Berlin had a Bitcoin community. You know, there's a lot of bars in Berlin. You could pay with Bitcoin in 2013. And, you know, we drew up more than one Bitcoin in bars, which was in hindsight, not the best decision. <laughs> 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 but, um, you know, basically from the community. And also I think one of the things that really determined was, was when the Ethereum Foundation, obviously, is a Swiss foundation but they open offices all around europe and one of those offices was in berlin yeah. so um, a, big, a big chunk of the blockchain of the Ethereum development happened in berlin and i think that really helped uh, kind of like boost the community locally which makes sense because the other question i was going to ask you in 2015 if you wanted to buy bitcoin I, may, maybe uh, you know you had some uh, software already uh, and exchanges like coinbase i'm not sure to be honest when it was established but i remember yeah. listening about you know hearing about the blockchain and the cryptocurrencies uh, around 2000 maybe 13 14 uh, because of all of the dark web you know um, silk road and all of that and i remember looking at bitcoin.com and if I, and i couldn't find a place where to buy them right i didn't start to go in forum but so one of my questions was actually where would you buy them, you know, in 2015? Because you, yeah, you were a fairly adopter, a, a, fair, yeah. a fairly early adopter. So yeah. So obviously, wait, wait, I have to I have to walk down memory lane. Um, I think I mean we were using Poloniex. I will have to think what I where we put our first bitcoins. We also mine a few. Uh, oh wow! Very early on, burned more than one computer attempting to do that. <laughs> it was a very it was it was a very a very short. It paid off, no? <laughs> a little, it was a little bit. Sort of. I mean, it, it was a very short-lived enterprise. I can tell you. I mean, it was not 2010, right? So it was already a bit later. But um, yeah, I think it, I mean we did a bunch of in Poloniex, and then I think we bought like in some German website. I will have to remember. I haven't bought a Bitcoin in a very long time. Um, and I haven't traded in a very long time. Um, you're Ethereum, uh, hardcore on Ethereum now? Or no, I, lo I love Bitcoin. No, yeah. I, just, I just love Bitcoin, but I don't have the necessity, I think, to put more capital in than the initial one that was put in, I guess. Um, and of course, I use like Red Wallet for like daily stuff and things yeah. like that. 
but I will have to go back to you on that one. Where did we go the first one? I don't remember. No, it, it was more, to be honest with you, it was yeah. more of a, um, uh, you know, it was more of a note than a question because I think a lot mm. of people didn't know where to buy. So yeah. you must have been very much an insider, you know, to this word. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. many people just didn't know where to where to go, you know, to buy them. Where to get uh, started. Yeah. Yeah, mm. it's true. It, it is it is very challenging. I think even still today, some people like, you just tell them you have to buy ether and they're like, where do I start? Yeah, I have, I have other questions about this because I think, you know, being an early adopter, uh, I yeah. wanted to ask you, you know, how you felt about, you know, w- when the bubble became huge, when the price surged and you saw probably a lot of stakeholders getting into it for quick money, whether, you know, how you felt about it. Were you irritated to see uh, this surge of interest, not because of the potential of the technology, but just because of a quick gain or mm. uh, which I suspect is going to be the case? Uh, <laughs> but you know uh, how was Berlin during the time uh, how was the community you're a part of how did the community react does this have to do anything with you know the cultural currency this concept that you have on promoting subcultures so mm. uh, but before that I wanted to ask you one thing um, I've seen from your LinkedIn profile that your university is called Bauhaus or has something to do with the Bauhaus movement was that Bauhaus, yeah. yeah was that is that something to do with the original German school of design? Yes, it does. Yeah? Oh, wow. It does. It does. It's very, very funny. That in German, you say, does Bauhaus come aus Weimar? So the Bauhaus comes from Weimar. And the founder of Bauhaus, Walter Kropius, he was uh-huh. living in, in Weimar back then. And he founded ba- uh, the Bauhaus in Weimar. And Weimar is a very small town here in Germany, but it's very important Very town. important, it's, yeah. It's, it's the Republic, no, it needs to be a Republic. The Repo- correct. Mm, the Republic, yeah. the first German Republic was started in Weimar and the Bauhaus was founded in Weimar. So the, the first Bauhaus building was uh, of the school of the Bauhaus was uh, a building by an architect called Henry van de Velde. And that's it. the building Fabian and I went to school in. Oh, that wow. Really that is fun. incredible. Yeah. yeah so really for fun. those who yeah. don't know, like the Bauhaus, sorry if I'm slaughtering the name, uh, but uh, it is probably the most important, I'd say, uh, design. How would you define design movement of uh, the past 100%, century? 100%. And, yeah. And uh, it's influencing so. everything from the minimalist movement to Ikea's uh, uh, furniture everything. and everything else, uh, color selection everything. apps, uh, UX, I think is hugely, so user experience 100%. is hugely influenced by that. And so that's 100%. what I found interesting, right? Because you said that you've uh, established and, you know, managed EY's um, innovation lab. And it's interesting because from what I understand, you don't have a technical background, which means that you approach it from a problem solving designer perspective rather than a, you know, a technical one, which must right. produce quite like, interesting outcome, right? Because user adoption so. probably is become, I mean, you're focused more on user adoption, I would say, than on the technical yeah. problem, right? A hundred percent. I think obviously there are people far better qualified than I to, to solve technical issues. But I do think, um, I think what I bring to to our company and to the work that we do, and I think kind of like the advantage that I have through my education is that I always think about how can we do things better and kind of like that very iterative architectural approach to solving problems, like a design mentality. Yeah. We, you know, we know it's popular now with design thinking and stuff like that. Of course. And there's a lot of like mm. architects uh, in different roles in life. Um, but yeah, definitely. I think for me at the end of the day, it's about making things that are either, either really beautiful and really easy to use yeah, or that you don't even notice that you're using. So I think which it's is either... which is great because I think that that's yeah. what blockchain needs. Because yes. I think the difference between a successful, you know, customer-facing company in the blockchain space, for example, one of our clients, uh, you know, in the day-to-day as a lawyer, uh, which is Itoro, is very successful. Mm. I know that they also provide for you know financial services, yeah. but they also have the uh, you know uh, more DLT and crypto branch here in Gibraltar. Right. And I think like. You know, companies that are bridging the gap between um, areas which are hard to, you know, get into and allow customer to, you know, become a part of it. That's, I think, the secret sauce. It's not secret, but to success. And I think that blockchain is very, as you said, it's quite novel. So uh, people that really know about it usually are very technical and focus on very technical solution and aspect of it. And, you know, I'm working in it from a legal perspective. And sometimes I lose myself when I'm trying to understand, 
what is the benefit, which I'm sure is huge, you know, from a from a yeah. technical perspective. But I, I right. struggle to understand from a user point of point of view what mm. would the benefit be in practical terms. So I think 100%. it's uh, it's uh, it's very interesting. But going back now, you know, to the, there is the the bubble. Sorry if I'm jumping a bit around. It's more of a no conversation. I said, um, so you know, we spoke about. Uh, about the bubble in 2017, 18, I'd say, uh, and how was Berlin during the time? How has it changed? Uh, for example, how is it now? I guess that yeah. there has been a surge of interest and now a bit of a, it um, probably normalized itself a little bit, yes. although it keep growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I think that's a very interesting question because I think this is part of like the cycle that technologies go through and definitely that bubble was one of the cycles and you know, what I noticed was this incredible influx of people. All of a the sudden, there were so many people coming yeah. to work in the technology. And, you know, there were a lot of like pseudo experts and, you know, some sketchy figures. Yes. Um, but the interesting thing is after the crash, it was like the incantation. So just as they came in, they went away. They many went of out, them. yeah. They went out. And I think, you know, it's part of the cycle. I think, I mean... In our, obviously it's fun like trading is fun right who doesn't like making money like it is of fun course. right and and i think it's one of those things that people get attracted to and you know it makes the news it's the highlights oh my god guy makes one yeah million the dream dollars. like paid one dollar for a thousand bitcoin now as a millionaire he lost the keys and he's looking at trash like okay, looking... you know? <laughs> yes <laughs> you know so so we all know the stories right so so obviously that is very seductive right and i think it's very similar to those times, you know, where people were funding oil in the Americas or when yeah. Gettys was getting the oil out of Kuwait, you know, like this crazy search of money. The Eldorado like, sort of race to Eldorado. Exactly, yeah. exactly, right? It's like this, you you find a money printing machine, right, basically. Yeah. And that's what people felt with Bitcoin and, and crypto in general. So I think a lot of people came in with like not the best intentions, and but it's part of the market. And in my view, in my personal opinion, I think, you know, we, I think what is, the important part is talk about that technology and, you know, the, the, the trading assets and the, and the cryptocurrencies, it's like a consequence, which can be really fun. Uh, but the technology is a very strong and solid part of it. And I think, you know, eventually we will have succeeded pretty much making the blockchain accessible for everyone and powering a bunch of businesses and new business models is the point when people are not talking so much about crypto anymore. So I think there's going to be a balance between you know, the technology becoming really successful and the conversations around crypto becoming yeah. less and less. I, I completely I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I think personally that the most remarkable aspect of this whole industry fintech is the fact that, you know, up to now you could uh, command C, command V or control C, control V and just copy data. So <clears throat> digital data lacked yeah. a story, lacked an identity. But now through the use of distributed ledger technology, what you have is effectively, I think, real digital assets, which also is one of the products that, La, uh, Luxor or Luxor? How do you? Mm -hmm. What's the correct pronunciation? Either or. Either, either. or. Okay. You can say Luxor if you're more Latin. You can say Luxor if you're more Anglo-Saxonian. Anglo They're all correct. In the, <laughs> I work in the UK. And I'm Italian. <laughs> I'm like in the middle. I'm stuck. <laughs> what do I say? Like me. I, I what do you say? Who I'm talking. Look, I say Luxor, but I can Luxor. say Luxor. If I talk to my mom, I will say Luxor. So. But if you want to sound sophisticated, you say Luxor. But if I want to, if I want to speak <laughs> to an American VC, I will say Luxor. <laughs> Let's call it Laxo then. So, um, so this is this is actually a very interesting uh, aspect of it. I think it's the ability to have a unique, um, to give you know a, a piece of data, unique from a unique identity. Let's say. So I'm very passionate okay. about interactive entertainment, and I think that you know as blockchain get integrated in video game now, of course there is also a surge of interest in esports and video game. I think it would be very interesting to see value going back to players because right now you spend time and you spend money and effort and you know the player really most of the time doesn't get much uh, in return apart from being entertained um totally. which which is already a form of return i'm not criticizing the yeah. companies but it would be great if in addition to that you could for example you know in a role play game uh, have the ability to transfer your item to someone else. I know that there is a problem with transferring the item from a money laundering perspective. There are some video games where you can do that. Uh, for example, um, Counter-Strike was one of them. Uh, Fortnite as well, but with the coin 
uh, there were mm. some you know scandals but i think again bitcoin can very much solve that and i think the fintech industry provides for amazing solution in terms of kyc and aml you know and actually yeah. again laxo has a product uh, with the universal public profile you could kind of track it and if you and i know that some are critical of that but if you look at chain analysis or other instrument like that you could verify that the funds coming from that user or even that that user profile wasn't involved in any dodge activity yeah. which you know has its pros and cons because on the one hand you have you know monitoring state monitoring and lack of privacy on the other, you can address some some conflict. So, what is your opinion on this? You know, especially with respect to the universal um, public profile that Laxo okay. offer, which, from what I understand, yeah. is a basically a digital badge which is associated with an individual or with a company. Correct. Right? Correct. What so are the I'll, benefits? And uh, please. Yes, definitely. Yes, a great question. So, you know, the universal public profile comes from the need of okay. So, as you said. The blockchain allows us for create digital uniqueness, right? For the first time. Yeah. Um, and you know that digital uniqueness can have, you know, history, you can have metadata, you can have provenance, you can have all kind of information around it. But the bigger question is where who is issuing what and why do they have the authority to do so? Right. Yes. So for example, if I will be a very famous designer, the fact that I do wallets might be a very important thing, right? In compared to perhaps somebody who is not famous. So obviously my identity is a very valuable thing. So the idea behind universal public profiles is to have a unique digital identifier. So that is your referential point on this digital universe. And from that profile, you can start issuing digital assets. So effectively, if I will be a fashion brand, I will have a profile under my name and under that name, I can start issuing assets or start issuing, you know, can be the identity for a physical good, which we, we love to call the digital, or it can be the identity, thank you, it can be the identity for a 100% digital good, like a digital fashion item or some digital sneakers or whatever it might be. Yes. Um, and from the identity, you start issuing them. So the universal public profile, obviously, in our vision, it would be great to have users also having some sort of universal public profile. Obviously, we enter there in a bit of a complex territory when it comes to, you know, data protections and things like that. Yes. So, um, you know, we are working on it and we want to have a version of an universal public profile for a user from where they can basically access and own things, you know, with their blockchain identity, um, we're working on it. Initially, the first version that we're putting out is basically uh, focusing not in private individuals, but basically my profile as a designer, my, you know, ah, okay. professional. Okay. Or, or mm -hmm. a professional, it can be a corporation or a professional profile, you know, something that you don't consider, you know, you're not going to start issuing identities for your kids baby pictures. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if somebody will ever do that, but you know what I mean. And, you know, our goal is basically to have to, through those identities, they start powering that digital economy. And one of the biggest, you know, one of the biggest issues, or not issues, but I think a friction points when people are trying to onboard themselves to use blockchain technology is they don't know where the heck do I start. And, you know, all of these concepts sounds great. Like, okay, I can have my profile and I can have digital assets and I can issue and I have all of this control. But you, you don't know how to do it. And honestly, if you're not like a very good developer, it might be really difficult for yeah. you to do. So or the reason also, feel, I would say. Also the reason, right? why should you do it? Uh, aside from right. the you know right. potential for gaining uh, you know money for yeah. making money what is the actual use for doing that whereas in your in the right. case you're describing there is a, a practical benefit for the user to absolutely so for example if i would be you know we see this whole digital economy like truly emerging right and we've been talking about it for two years now but now with corona everybody's like getting it like right now like yeah. i'm getting phone calls every mm -hmm. day from all, everybody i talk to for the last two years like asking me to do something with them um but effectively it is you know you want to have those digital goods you want to own those digital goods you want to have the ability to trade those digital goods and you want to have the ability of taking those digital goods into different places. A place might be the R chat. It might be my social media profile. I'm wearing it in social media. It might be in Fortnite or it might be in Animal Crossing. But at the end of the day, yeah. I own the asset. I take the asset, whatever I want. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of like the, 
kind of like the thing that we think is incredibly important when we're talking about through the real digital economy. Yeah, right? also like for intellectual people... property, it would be great 100%. for a license, right? Because then mm-hmm. it means that like from, let's say, the equivalent of uh, <clears throat> iTunes, you know, to buy movies and songs. I mean, right. now now that there are services, ownership of uh, I don't know, creative material is less and less I think common. It's more of a software as a service. So yeah. I mean, media as a service. I would say uh, more than yeah. uh, than actually ownership. But it's interesting to be able to tokenize licenses, you know, so that I can I sell to you a software. And it doesn't have to be managed directly by the <clears throat> by the licensor, but also licensees can sub- basically sell between themselves the permission and create a secondary market. Yeah, that's really hundred percent. And I th- and I think the best way to prove your intellectual property is to put them in public. Right. So if it's registered on the blockchain where everybody can verify it and it's timestamp yeah. is the best way, right? Like there's no doubt and you know, avoidance of all doubt have been achieved yeah. by making it public. And I think this is a practice that is common, you know, within like in Switzerland, within the luxury, you know, jewelry, watch manufacturers, all of these guys, they go and register their designs with the notar. They yeah. go to the notary and the notary, you know, he sees the drawings and he registers. It's like the one man blockchain. You know, and basically he just the notary just said, yeah, in this point in time. Ah, so you're using yeah. notaries because that's what I was about to ask. Yeah. The problem, of course, of using blockchain by uploading information is that the defect is not the blockchain, but the person uploading the information. That's where right. you can th- that's where you can can introduce inaccuracies, right? So in yeah. Switzerland, you're using notaries to to certify but, the inform to uh, basically insert information on the blockchain. That's how it works. Well. No, they, no, 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 they, they do. Ah. That's how it's been done historically. Even though it would be ah. great, they could just now the Swiss can make like their own little not notary blockchain, or you know, but you could still they could be yeah. like little oracles, right? They could be the notaries, could be put, put, possibly they could certify be the, the uploading of the information, right. yeah, that could right? Be interesting. Not, that could be interesting, but you know, but in this case, you know, if you have the profile, if you have let's say. Uh, Bulgari, they have this very enigmatic snake, yeah. you know, thing that for sure was registering in Switzerland somewhere by the notary. You know, you could potentially say if Bulgari has their own blockchain profile, they can make the registration themselves on chain. They don't need the notary anymore, right? Yeah. Because if they have their own profile and they have basically a dashboard where they can click through and publish, um, and you know maybe make make effectively the registration then they don't need the notary anymore uh but yeah definitely those are those kind of things where you see okay the like the old world practices are very similar to something that we could introduce right now using blockchain technology and it's just just way more effective than you know going to a notary and what about those guys maybe so that's that's the benefit and you mentioned of course data protection is one of the concerns you know of this technology I'll play devil's advocate, let's say. But Go ahead. you know, when when you hear about things like a digital identity, especially when you couple it with a blockchain that may or with a distributed ledger technology, which may be present immutability as one of the aspects, you know, to increase trust, especially when it comes to identity. And then you couple it together with something like the social credit score in China, you know. Mm. Uh, that in my opinion, becomes a bit scary, you know, when you start mm-hmm. to have something which, so, you know, everyone makes mistake. And, uh, you know, when I was younger, I was definitely <laughs> uh, sillier than really? I am now. Yeah, so yeah. I would, I would really, although I didn't have a problem with the law or anything like that, you know, the moment that you start having camera everywhere that, you know, uh, record every activity that you do since your age zero uh, onward and having that awarding you a credit score, that credit score going perhaps on a technology like blockchain where it's immutable, you know, and affecting yeah. your future, your ability to secure a loan, your ability to change your life around, that to me become a very black mirror sort of reality. Mm-hmm. And it's a reality that I'm scared of. Is it something that um, you're, you know, you thought about Lux? Or do you think, uh, you know, a ethical consideration within a design of a product could address mm. that satisfactorily? Mm. Do you think there is need for regulation? What, what's your take mm. on that, if you have one? Well, yeah, yeah, no, that's very interesting. Obviously, you know, our, our goal with Luxo is less, um, we're not occupying ourselves, let's say, with so much of like the the very serious part of your identity. We see it more with your um, social identity almost, yes. right? Like the identity you will use to collect digital sneakers, right? That's not the I same see. like your 
your ID passport issue or the government, yeah. something like that, right? I think, I don't know, I mean, I guess in the European Union, everywhere they're doing it, but I mean, I know the Italians, you guys have that very funky ID that looks like from 300 years ago. It's really pretty. But in Germany, we have now these new cards and the, the card, card yeah. comes with, with an online login and it's very steam it, it's you feel that it's almost like one step below behind like it's very close to becoming I'm almost on chain identity it's pretty remarkable yeah. what you can do with that identity card i mean it's not people are not talking too much about it for whatever reason but it can, you can do a lot you can do you can sign things online with that with that id and stuff like that um i think you know it's just a matter of time that we start having those systems you know i think that we know it with technology it doesn't go backwards yeah. so Definitely is going to continue moving forward. So something is going to happen. What is going to happen, you know, I my guess is as good as anyone else's. But I think it goes down to, you know, right now we have zero level of transparency. So our record scores are like, our credit scores are like, you, you know, we don't, we suppose we have a good scoring, but we really don't know. Yeah. And we don't, we don't know what has generated that score and things like that. So it might be actually very good for us as, as the consumers to have certain level of access of what it is that our data is about, or, you know, yeah. and or owning their data, yeah. which right? is, I and think, that, the counter argument. Yeah. Owning their right? data. Yeah. Like I want to know what my stuff is and maybe I own it. Right. And, yeah. and you know, when you say that it's immutable and it's there forever, it doesn't mean that it has to count forever. Right. Like with credit scores, you possibly know this better than I do, but I think it's like every five years you have a bit of a refresh. Semi, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Semi tabula rasa, unless you do something <laughs> really crazy, I guess. But you know, you have some kind of like they forgive you after five years certain things that maybe you didn't pay your credit card when you were in college and stuff like yeah. that. Um, but I think you know, at the end, I think transparency and control it's not a bad thing, right? Like right now. All of these systems are happening without we necessarily knowing what is going on. I agree with you. Um, yeah. And we have very little insight. So I think it's better. And I think, you know, the fear is, I mean, I always compare it to like being in a nudist beach or being in a regular beach, right? If everybody's naked, you might not feel uncomfortable being naked. But if you're the only one naked, then. Yeah, no, I agree. I see the parallel. Yeah, yeah it's like right? social so, media. It's so, uh, the same. Yeah. yeah. If everybody, you know, if everybody's data, I mean, not that I want full transparency, but I, what I mean is if there is certain, if we all have certain level of access to our own data and everybody has the same, um, then it becomes socially not, acceptable. Like there is nothing so like, to hide. You're not sticking out. Yeah. Right. I use the same example with like, although it's something that, you know, I'm, I'm worried about, um, like social new, new generation on social media and, you know, everything is out there since they're mm -hmm. a teenager, but then you think about it and you're like, everyone has everything out. So you can't really use Nothing one thing against enough. another. Like, uh, exactly. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I definitely, uh, yeah, I definitely see, see, see your point. And you know, it's like, really interesting. Yeah. I love what you said because in different words, you said we had as a guest, uh, Mihai Vashu from uh, Modex. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we addressed one, one of the questions was uh, similar to this one. Um, you know, GDPR, data protection, and how do you couple that with blockchain? And he said something interesting, like the, what currently is the right to be forgotten might well evolve into the right not to access, you know, or to forbid access. So right now, as you said, we don't really know where our data is and how it is being used, you know, and it's becoming increasingly um, part of, you know, the common knowledge of everyone, especially when you have, you know, uh, programs on Netflix, like uh, what, The Social Dilemma, I think, yeah, which I watched. And, so it's becoming more and more part of the conversation of everyday life, you know, and more of a concern, I would say. So I think blockchain has a lot of room in that. And I think it would be also good for us to be able to monetize our data and, uh, you know, subcategorize yeah. it and provide it to brands for <clears throat> the research. Because I don't yeah. see it as a negative thing, like providing yeah. uh, data with to corporations that produce services and goods really allows them to produce better services yeah. and goods. So right. it's not something negative. I think it's just, it would be fair if the user yeah. had some form of, ben like w was to benefit, which, you know, you can argue that, user already benefited because they can access services for the free product, like yeah, social, yeah and, and better product but you know it's a bit of a chicken and egg sort of uh, twist totally. so i i would like to if it's okay for you unless you want to add anything on this part i would like to move on one thing that i'm really interested about and it's the uh, the cultural currencies so yeah. th that part it's it, it sounds very interesting to me i'm very fascinated about subculture and uh, 
uh, you know, before being in Gibraltar, I was in London, and that's probably my favorite part about big cities like London, Berlin, is that whatever you're into, you will find your community and you will find the subculture. Yeah, so is totally. that a way to empower them uh, by establishing small economies? How, how does it work? What was the idea behind it? Totally. So I think, you know, we were, when Fabian and I, we were kind of like brainstorming about like the key principles that we see um or the three components you might need in order to power a blockchain economy around, you know, digital goods, consumer goods. Um, we are thinking of its identities, identities for people, identity for products. And obviously tokenization was um, what tokens represent as an, basically just an unit of measuring, right? It's just you're measuring something, um, quantifying something. So, you know, we start making a lot of brainstorming around it. And obviously Fabian, he proposed ERC20 back in 2015. And, you know, we were talking, you know, about his vision at the moment, you know, when I was a consultant, I was talking to my clients about like ICOs and things like that. And they were like, this stuff is never going to happen. Two years later, it happened everywhere, right? Boom, but, yeah. you know, we were thinking, boom. And then, um, you know, we were talking about this and, you know, it wasn't necessarily the thought behind Fabian's, you know, when he was doing ERC20, he said, I'm going to power the ICO industry, you know, it was like, I'm going to enable everybody to create a token that might represent whatever. And in that whatever, kind of like we stuck thinking like, okay, what you can tokenize that is not necessarily a financial instrument. And it can, it can basically help you make tangible things that are right now quite untangible. So I think a lot of like the interactions that we do in the internet um, and a lot of the things that are driving us in our social behavior is around the untangibles, right? And I think, yes, you know, I completely agree. Get, get, getting a like from a specific person or getting a heart or getting, you know, yeah. whatever it might be, it has a meaning, right? So I think um, how I always keep the most simplified example of a cultural currency will be you are a very young designer um, you post a sketch of a design and then you have somebody, well, Carl Lagerfeld has now passed, but you have somebody of the caliber of Carl Lagerfeld liking that post. That's a major cultural currency. Like his like is a major cultural currency. Okay. And the, and the fact that he gave that like uh, means something, right? Because obviously somebody like Lagerfeld, he was not liking random drawings on the internet for sure. And he was for sure very selective about the stuff that he liked from other designers. So that expressed that he, with all of his heritage and all of his knowledge, he approves what you just yeah. did. So it's kind of like a seal of approval, just condensed into a little like. So, you know, and that's basically, we see it like, oh, maybe giving likes is almost like you're minting a token. And, you know, you have either the ability of minting an able amount of tokens, and the more tokens you mint for liking, the less valuable your likes are but if you meant very few likes and you give them away those likes have a very high value in this cultural currency world so what we want to do is basically is make tangible and measure things communities we call it the connective tissue within communities um, for you know something that might not be very tangible so for example you could you could generate a community within, you know, a token for a community within a group or specific, you know, certain amount of activities or incentivize good behavior. If you go and clean this park in Berlin after Saturday night, you go on Sunday morning, yeah. you will get these tokens that will represent free brunch at the Alton Hotel. I don't know, you know, like it can represent all kinds of things. Um, and you can start creating these gamifications and stuff like that. So basically what we want to start is to start thinking about very interesting um, interactions that can be tokenized that represent communities or belief systems or whatever it might be. Um, and those things are just basically created by anyone in whatever case, and they're not necessarily financial instruments. Because I think one of the stuff that is a bit almost unfortunate in the blockchain world right now is that everything became a financial instrument. Yes. Um, and then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. it's like we all need to have 17 lawyers in... Uh, no, that's a good thing. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. Yeah. And, and, I, hey, I come to like lawyers now. I'm like, I'm oh kidding. my God. Like every time I get one more lawyer, I'm like, am I one step closer to Imperial? 
but actually <laughs> <laughs> actually they're pretty nice people and i'm thankful to have to come with them they know stuff that i don't know so it's all good but you know what i mean so it is it is I know a what way you mean, yeah I, I think there is an opportunity to, you know, use blockchain technology to to materialize and to signalize different use cases. Yeah, yeah, different use cases. It's so important. It's, we are doing the same now with the podcast. What you said makes perfect sense. You know, we've had incredible guests. We yeah. really like, for you know, for the size of the podcast that we are, uh, video podcast, we've had like really, really good guests. All of them, most of them, I would argue, you know, although they are very interesting, their product revolves around financial services. So. That's why we started to branch out and we want to learn more about other use cases. You know, we've interviewed David Parenzo, um, which is the CEO of uh, Food Chain, and they're using blockchain together with other uh, technology like Internet of Things, machine learning, AI, to, um, you know, empower agriculture and production and the vertical farming. That was super interesting. This episode we're recording with you, it's again super interesting. Uh, last week we had Mark Johnson, um, and he was talking about the environment economy and uh, the use of blockchain, you know, to track carbon credit, which uh, you could say that it's a financial instrument, but not really, because it's more about allowing companies, you know, to be accountable and to demonstrate that. Like he was talking about a project he used to be involved with where they in artificially uh, inserted, uh, you know, artificial DNA strings within fuel in bunkering operation to make sure that the fuel, and it was all on the blockchain, to make sure that the fuel was coming from legitimate sources. So there are a lot of use cases of the technology which are so interesting. But as you say, rightly, first of all, everyone assumes that blockchain is only relevant to cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin you know, as soon as you say. Mm. And I think that takes away from the real potential of the technology because that automatically means that creators, people which are not part of the financial industry, my automatically discard blockchain for the time being because they think that right. it is not relevant to them where actually they could benefit yeah. tremendously of that exactly because of what you said at, at least right. in my opinion you know uh, yeah, um, a painter yeah. someone a designer an illustrator someone that create work and can tokenize it and instead of just sending a copy of it can send a, a blockchain based copy of uh, of that painting or illustration which is uh, pegged to this blockchain proof like that could be very, very valuable totally. for the customer because he knows that he has a unique piece uh, and uh, it's just incredible. Yeah. And I think there needs to be more awareness about the possible, about, about this, uh, this concept. Yeah. Totally. And listen, I do say, you know, right now there's this big hype about, around DeFi, even though most yes. of those, those so-called DeFi projects, you know, they're just Are like, very, <laughs> they're not DeFi and they're just very, very opportunistic, yeah. you know. But, you know, it is it is pretty self-serving. Like, it's great, but, you know, it won't happen at least you have a lot of other, you know, you need the economy, you know, the, I mean, it's not only the economy is not happening because we have banks and now we decentralized banks, so the economy continue running. You have yes. economies because there's a lot of other interactions happening. So I think in order to actually power a decentralized finance future, you need people, regular consumers, consuming regular products. They are yes. not... DeFi products. So I think to buy into it's the kind technology, of, yeah. Exactly. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, for, for us, it's about consumers, it's about consumer goods, you know, obviously digital or physical consumer goods is a lot about fashion, it's a lot about digital fashion, it's a lot about sneakers and collectibles and all yeah. of that fun stuff because well, one is the stuff that we like, but also the stuff that a lot of other people also like. And, you know, those are huge industries and, you know, there's a huge potential there to capture uh, a lot of value into power new completely new you know industries like the digital fashion industry doesn't exist at the moment per se but it might be the next trillion dollar industry you know so yeah this is the part where we are interested on and then all of those things will power that economy that will make DeFi make a bit more sense so that's kind of like where we are right now and you know people get a bit shocked when i say that you know we are not necessarily we don't consider ourselves a project within the DeFi uh, Space, universe, yeah. people get very confused. And it's like, but what, why is it confusing? You know, like our focus is very clear. Um, you know, um, obviously we are interested in the current uh, blockchain crowd and the cu current blockchain user, but I'm way more interested in all of those people who are not users at the moment. Yeah, so that, those no, are the that makes perfect sense. And That's what the about ones we want to convert. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, you no, mentioned uh, digital fashion, right? Or blockchain based mm -hmm. fashion. That's really interesting mm -hmm. to me. And I think you start seeing a little bit of that in video game. Uh, for example, I think uh, 
uh, what was it, Burberry that made some uh, skins yeah. for League of Legends, right? Against, like, yeah. uh, so and, and Louis Vuitton, as well. Louis Vuitton, yeah. sorry, yeah, not, Bur- not Burberry, you're right, sorry, it's yeah. Louis Vuitton. Um, and also, I think another brand, or I read, I remember, there someone, some designer designed an augmented reality based wedding dress that sold for like 10,000, which was basically an augmented reality filter. So it is starting, I think, but you said that you're looking yeah. into that. What is the potential for that? So it's collectible, like shoes, like Jordans yeah. on the blockchain with certificate. That's Correct. the kind of application? That's the kind of application we're looking into. And, you know, as I was saying before, it's about the ability of taking those assets into different places. So yeah. effectively, you know, we have like 100% digital fashion designers, designers who don't design clothes for the real world. Um, you know, right now, there's a few places where you can take them. You can take into to Samsar and like uh, VR chat and stuff. Yes. You can't really take it into any of the major games because they have like these closed silos. Um, but eventually, you know, we do see a future where they might have to open those silos or we will have like really good games with open worlds. So you will be able to take those assets everywhere. Or so it goes from, reality. Or no, like you'll be able right? to wear a customization exactly. and share it with user. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, basically I can wear something in augmented reality and you see it through your glasses, you see what I'm wearing and the other way around. So, yes. you know, we see that economy emerging. We see, you know, it's the first time the fashion industry can actually grow exponentially. There is an immense amount of like creativity and people creating those assets that at this point still have no purpose um, yeah. because, they, because they don't know how to issue a digital collectible because they're not crypto people. And, you know, if you don't sell it as a crypto asset, if it's not a blockchain unique identity, there's zero to, you know, there's no value into it. It's just yes. a gimmick. It's either you wearing it in a picture, but it's not a real good that you're owning. And by making them into, you know, tokenized, like people like to call them, you know, digitized uh, blockchainify products, you know, you can really own them and take them into They become places. real. They become I like become a real, real asset. Yeah, even it's a real the, asset. And especially ones that, uh, this is something I'm really passionate about, yeah. you reality since a number of years. And it's going to be the next interface. So we're not going to look at things through screen anymore. We're going to basically have a mixed reality. So, uh, so at that stage, how will you really distinguish between uh, real and not real? Well, I think that the real will be scarce, will be unique. Uh, we'll have characteristics which are intrinsic to that item. And with block with the blockchain technology, can, can with the DLT, you can get closer to that result. Of course, maybe yeah, you will lack totally. physicality, but again, augmented reality is not only visual stimulation. It can be also tactile. So if there are, if we will be wearing gloves that will simulate tact, you know, at the end of the day, we're perceiving reality through our uh, senses. If you're able to totally. affect those senses, then digital item could very well be perceived as real, which again, yeah. it's this dichotomy yeah. between scary and exciting. I'm more on the exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm always the very exciting too. But I, I do get every now and then some person freaking out on me and I'm like, but wait, this is great. Um, I, I had a meeting the other day and this guy told me, I told him like, hey, you know, like holy cows make the best burgers. It's just a matter of time that Apple is going to kill the iPhone for something better. Of course, yeah. And he told me, and he told me, oh no, we are going to always have iPhones. And I was like, well, no. that's was, that was the most stupid statement a person have ever look made. Look at the time. Neuralink. He's already just, like. Just look at, they just did it historically. Yes. I mean, you're saying that's completely stupid, you know, but a lot of people might think that. A lot of people think, hey, we're going to have iPhones forever. And the answer is no, you won't have an iPhone forever. Yeah, I agree. Just like, like computers are not the size of whole rooms thankfully anymore you know it's just part yeah. of the process so i think you know and definitely i think you know that the i do agree with you that the haptic is super important but honestly like we're not going through life touching people like we don't go like oh great coach. especially now <laughs> you, know, you don't touch anyone you know so you just see it you saw it and voila so yeah a, a lot of exciting things coming and i think again the yeah. technological convergence will of course show the potential for each technology that maybe you know on its own is harder to see so as you said you know a digital fashion designer will really be able to thrive in uh, an augmented reality uh, environment so i I really look forward for that to happen and i'm worried also about time uh, because we've almost it's almost been an hour um, i wanted to ask you is there anything you would like to talk about or you would like to add uh, some project that you're working toward I mean, let me see. I mean, obviously, as I, I was saying, you know, that our focus is basically, you know, on like 
that's kind of like um, obviously the, the consumer goods part of things and that public social media almost kind of presence of yeah. ourselves, right? So those public profiles. Um, you know, we are working in a plethora of things. One of the most exciting things that we're going to put out there is we're going to put out around April next year. We're going to launch together when we launch our mainnet. We're going to launch a really cool wallet, um, which is kind of like your digital vault for all kinds of things, like uh, your digital goods, your digital goods. You can collect the tokens that you're minting or that you are creating in your community or with your friends or from a brand or whatever it is that you're receiving them from. And then, you know, you can collect and trade your digital and physical goods. So it's kind of like it's our version of, you know, a digital crypto based uh, collectible asset vault. Okay. Let's say um, they were the going to put out. This... Luxus, you know, I mean, uh, the wallet. Yeah. Of... Yeah, hopefully, you know, we want to have more like, uh, you know, all of those cool assets, like, you know, all of these digital fashion designers who are working with um, digital artists and all of the stuff and also some of the brands who will start issuing digital certificates for a physical good. So you will wow. also have your, your digitals in the wallet um, and it will be kind of like a place where you just flex all of the stuff that you own and you trade and you see how they increase or decrease in value. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of stuff we're working on. You know, we do have a very extensive uh, advisory board within crypto and the fashion world. And I've seen it. Working... Incredible. You have Nike, yeah. Chanel, Burberry. Yeah, yeah, we're very yeah. proud. It's very impressive. Yeah. yeah, we are going to announce a very important advisor very soon, um, with whom we are going to make like a very exciting collaboration. Um, and I think that's going to be the best kind of like demonstration of what blockchain can do and the convergence of all of those concepts that we love around the cultural currency and digitizing goods and, you know, that universal profile being kind of materialized and why it's so important to have it. So this new advisor that we're going to announce hopefully in January, um, it's kind of like um, now moving towards this new, oh, sorry. Um, oh. He's moving, he basically is moving to the next stage of his career. Um, and Luxo is part of that next stage. So it's going to be like a very big announcement. I think people are going to be super impressed. Wow, I look forward to it. I started to follow yeah. the company and everything. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, I really look forward to that. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Apologies for the technical issues. Probably the conversation no would have continued a little bit more uh, if it wasn't for this. But uh, I really hope maybe you know, to have you on again, uh, especially after this announcement that I'll be waiting for, like, uh, look at the horizon <laughs> to, to see that. And, um, you know, thank you so much for coming on Blockchain Rock. It's been a great episode, uh, an extremely interesting episode. Uh, so, yeah, on behalf, you know, of, of uh, the staff at Blockchain Rock, let's say, thank you so much for coming, Marjorie. It was really, really nice. Well, thank you, Omri. I think, uh, listen, don't sweat it because of the technical issues. It wouldn't be 2020 if something weird doesn't happen. So it's just part of the ethos of the, the time we are living. So all good. It was absolutely wonderful talking to you. I could have talked for two more hours. Um, but yeah, stay. definitely yeah. We, stay, we stay in touch. Thank you so much for inviting me. And, you know, don't be a stranger anytime I want, you have I want, my email. Thank you so much for coming. I think your project is really exciting i think you know as you mentioned the board and like the people that are involved in your project that in itself you know is evidence of uh, how how of a uh, how solid your offering is and how serious you are and i really look forward to see you know laxo growing as a company and and uh, you know increasing its offering I, I really look forward to that thank you so much thank Marjorie. You. thank you thank you bye everyone you.